You know, we need the voice of God to speak to us. How many believe that? Without the voice of God, we really have no relationship with God. Without recognizing the voice of God, we really have no relationship with God. How can you follow someone you do not recognize it, that is speaking? How do you follow somebody? How does someone lead you if you cannot hear and recognize their voice? Because all kinds of voices are talking right now. You know that, right? The voices of media, the voices of society, so, and so many areas of culture, so many voices speaking. This is true. This is true. This is the right way. This is the right thing. So many, how do you navigate living life in a culture where so many voices are bombarding you all the time? The only way is to hear and recognize the one voice, the one voice, the voice of the shepherd. In John chapter 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear, the word for voice is, is, is sound or tone. They hear the sound or tone of my voice. And there are many different tones. Revelation likens the voice of God to a, a mighty rushing water. You know that if you take an oscilloscope and you measure frequency in a waterfall, there's over 20,000 different tones in a waterfall. And John, in the book of Revelation, likens the voice of God to a mighty rushing water, like a waterfall. He also likens the voice to a symphony of harpists, all playing. You ever been to a symphony? You got to be in the right room, right, to really distinguish the sound. If you're in the wrong room, if you were in this room with a symphony, it wouldn't work very well. You got to be in the right acoustically treated environment to distinguish and enjoy the sound of a symphony. Well, the voice of God can feel like this at times where you don't know how to distinguish what it is that he's saying in the midst of all the other garbage that's coming at you. So what do you need? You need a, the proper acoustically treated environment. It says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. The word for hear, you know what it, little, it literally means this. That it can be transliterated, translated in the English as acoustics. My sheep have created an acoustically treated environment in their life to distinguish between the 20,000 different tones that I'm speaking in. Powerful. And the only way you learn to distinguish the tones is by leaning in in moments like these. In moments when you are alerted because you feel stirred. How many feel stirred in the room right now? You feel stirred. Well, this is, this is Deuteronomy chapter 32, 11 and Haggai chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11 says, An eagle stirs up its nest. It hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. It stirs up its nest to get them excited to get out. That word for stir, stir is the word ur in the Hebrew. And it's the same word that it's used when God speaks to people and it stirs up their spirit. You see it in Haggai chapter 1 when they were discouraged about the temple being in ruins. And they, and they, they, they wanted to rebuild the temple and they needed some encouragement because they had started but they were discouraged. And God came and spoke to Haggai the prophet and said, tell the people I am with you. And listen to what it says here. Verse 13 of chapter 1 of Haggai chapter 1 says, Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of the people. And they were so stirred they began to build again. How many of you felt like you started something and you stopped? You, you stepped out of the boat of your comfort. You kind of stepped into something. I'm believing God for this thing. And then you kind of got discouraged and you stopped. You had a goal. You had a target. You had a plan. New Year's resolution. You felt like God gave you the New Year's resolution. You started a process, a faith process. But then you got discouraged, so you stopped. How many would confess to that? Only a few people. You need that stirring again. 
You need to hear God because when God speaks, it stirs you up to do what he's called you to do. So pay attention to the stirring. That's why it's so important that we recognize the voice of God. And he likens the same word that's used to stir up the people is the same word used as an eagle stirs up its nest. It like gets its eaglets excited to get out of the nest, to fly. Maybe for the first time, some of you, you've never gotten out of the nest. You're, you're stuck in your comfort zone. You've been in the boat of comfort for way too long. And God's like, i got to stir you up. I gave you a dream when you were a kid. I gave you a dream when you were a teenager. But you've let life kind of pass you by. You've let all the excuses. You have all the excuses as to why you can't do this and you can't do that. Just like Moses did. God calls you. God's, God's inviting you into a process. You're like, I can't. I'm not educated enough. I'm not qualified enough. I'm, I'm rejected. I'm not the kind of person that needs to be the, the person that I need to be to do the thing that I feel like you told me to do. It doesn't make any sense. I don't even believe your word now, God, because it doesn't, nothing, nothing seems to be working out for me. My prayer today is that you would be stirred in your spirit. Because the worst thing that you can be is idle. Paul warns us about this. He says to Timothy, warn those who are idle. The worst place you can be is idle, motionless, dreamless, hopeless. It's the worst place, dangerous. Neutral is never good. The brakes may work, but the gas doesn't. The moment you need to speed up, you can't because you got, you're not in the right gear. The gray zone is never good. The fence is never good. You're either all in on one side or you're all out on the other side. And even God said it in Revelation, I would rather you be hot or cold but not lukewarm. It's like coffee. It's brutal when it's lukewarm. All those people out there that drink your coffee all day, I don't know how you do it. Something's possessed you. I don't know how it works, but it's either got to be hot or it's really cold in a good thermos, says the guy in construction. But I, 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 I just want to say this. I feel like the Lord wants to stir up the women in the house today. I said all this to say, and it's not really, this is kind of like a shameless, I guess, not unplanned plug for tomorrow, next Sunday, Mother's Day. We have an awesome panel of women going to be on the platform. It's going to be an amazing Sunday. Bring your moms out. Bring your dads out. Bring your enemies out. Bring your friends out. It's going to be an amazing, amazing Sunday for Mother's Day. But I've heard this word twice now, and I feel, and I'm just, I'm just processing this. This is not nothing. This is not what I was going to do this morning. But I feel like God wants to stir up the women of, of the house. And I want to share just a word that God gave me in the beginning of the season, beginning of this year, in context of this. And then we'll see what takes place. I saw, and it's not just, the, please hear me, I'm going to read this so I don't miss something. It's not just about women, but... I want to hone in on that, that, that space or that, that spot where I really felt like the Lord was highlighting the women. I saw three phases of leadership transition in the spaces of the church, but specifically in the political space. And that we are to watch this space over the next 18 months. Now, this was in the beginning of the year, so this leads us into next, around next summer. That in the next 18 months that God wanted us to watch these three phases of leadership transition. And especially watch what begins within the church as a whole. And then watch what takes place in the political one. I saw a shuffle, I saw a shakedown, and I saw a shake out. So three words that God highlighted to me. The shuffle. It's like if you picture like a shuffleboard, you're, or you're shuffling things around. I saw a shakedown, and then I saw a shake out. In this vision, I saw a massive shuffleboard. And I felt the Lord say that will be, there will be a great leadership shuffle, a great leadership shakedown, and then a great leadership shake out. 
This is both in the church and in the political space. The shuffle is a repositioning, the shakedown is a restructuring, and the shakeout will be that of a fallout. And when I was in, this was in the beginning of the year, but when I was in uh, New Brunswick several weeks ago, I felt the Lord speak to me and say, watch the fall because the fall will be the beginnings of some of the fallout. That this fall will, begin, will, will be some of the beginnings of this fallout. In this next season, leaders in two specific areas are being both pushed out and pulled in. One of the signs to follow is to watch what I do with the women in leadership and in power in the next season. And I just feel like I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some major attack on the women in this next season as a result of what God is saying. And to watch for the attack that may try to come because of what God is saying and doing. When you are uncertain about what to do or think in this next season, just know that this is not time to run for the hills or to hide, but a time to be firmly planted. I feel the Lord would say that Canada is not your first home. I am. Your country is not your security. I am. So many in the church has tried to find security, strength, and confidence at times in the wrong things, situations, and circumstances as the last season has felt catastrophic in a way and or painful to watch. But in this time, I am redirecting my church's attention to the right place in this season. All things are becoming new, not first on the outside, but on the inside for my people. It begins in the house, in the church. It begins in the church. This will be proven true in the next phase of Canada's future. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 16, verse 8, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. We cannot be shaken by any of the shaking and shuffling because he is our stability. Hebrews says we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. I thought the Lord said that there is an eight ball leader in power and influence. I saw it like an eight ball, you know, like in pool. You don't want to sink that ball too early or you forfeit the game. The eight ball has to be sunk at the right time or the whole game is messed up. The repositioning has to happen at the right time. But I saw an eight ball leader in power and influence and that once they were off the table, just like in the game of pool, a resetting of the table will begin. There is a sequence for this to work. There is an order. I felt him say, watch this next season like you would observe a game of pool. It's about precision, timing, and the order of things. It's about order. Moving out the eight ball leader before its time is detrimental to the game. Perseverance and patience will be the church's best friend in the next season and era. I have no idea who the eight ball leader is. I have no idea, but I saw it as one with position and power. Think about this next season from the lens of the table. It's funny because next week, that's the, that's the conversation. It's around a table, and it's with women. Think about the next season of the, and I didn't even think put this together until right now. Think of the next season from the lens of the table, the table for both the church and the power structures of our nation. And just as the Lord said in Psalms 23, that he prepares a table, we sung this before earlier, which, by the way, like I decided to share this last night. I didn't know the set list until this morning. Harley was supposed to send it to me this week, but she didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. And so I get here, and everything's about the women and the table. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? And the woman is being attacked. And I'm like, God, what are you saying? See, I pay attention to this stuff, and I get stirred up by this stuff because God, this is how God speaks, you guys. This isn't a joke. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to just do church. I don't want to just play the game. Come to church. Like, you can do that anywhere else. Like, we want to do business here. Like, God's agenda. God has an agenda today. He has an order of things. He wants to speak. 
He wants to deposit something in you. He wants to bring order. He wants to bring correction. He wants to bring perspective. He wants to stir up our spirit. So when we leave here, we're more alive than when we came in. And if you came in just to do the normal thing, I'm sorry. I apologize. Think about this next season from the lens of the table. Psalms 23, that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We cannot be afraid, listen to this, to sit at the table with those that feel like an enemy. And let me just tell you, the tables in life that Jesus is speaking about here really speak about our battles. In the midst of the struggle, he prepares the buffet. In the midst of the chaos, he's like, I got your provision right here. You want to get your provision outside of this season because you want it to be easy. You want it to be all good in the hood. It's not going to be that way. I'm going to provide for you everything you need at the table that sometimes feel like, feels like a battle. You're in the presence of the battle. That's where my provision is going to be, at the table. In this season of your life, when it's hard, stay seated. Because if you get up prematurely and you peace out, you're missing on my provision. You might exit the battle, but what you're also exiting is my provision. My buffet is at the table. This is a word for some of you that are, will, are, are thinking of getting up and exiting something prematurely. You get up at the wrong time, you're missing out. You might miss out in the main course. You had the appetizer, you had the soup, you had the salad, but you were too impatient for the filet mignon. And you got up because it was hard. It was taking way too long. You were getting mad at the chef. God knows what he's doing. God knows your season is not a surprise to God. He's not like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was going to happen to them. That they would be in this place at this time with this struggle. No, he's up there. He's in full knowledge of it all. But you know what he's not? He is not in control of your life. He's in charge. You're in control. You have the keys to his beamer, and you can drive it wherever you want. So don't blame God when you crash it into the tree. He's given you freedom, free will, to take this life and steward it how you want to. You're the one in control. He's the one in charge. Don't get it confused. Saying stuff like God's in control is a cop-out and an untheological statement to excuse yourself from stewarding life. He's in charge. You are in control. Trust me, all parents would know this because you know you can't control your kids sometimes, can you? If you were really in control, man, your kids would be like flawless angels all the time, right? No, you're in charge of them. They're the ones in control. Hopefully you can guide That was a word of knowledge for somebody in the room. I don't know who it was for, but let's just continue back here in this space. The Lord has prepared everything needed to manage the seat that we have been seated at. This is my seat. I'm managing my seat. Quitting in life is forfeiting your seat. Quitting a season prematurely in life is like forfeiting your seat that was meant for you to sit in. Remember, John and Judas sat at the same table. John, who loved God with all his heart and laid his head on God's Jesus' chest at the Last Supper in the midst of right beside, on the other side was Judas. On either side of Jesus was Judas. It wasn't Peter. It was Judas and it was John. It was betrayal and it was love. At the table of life, every table you sit at in life, you will always Wrestle with these two tensions, love and hate, love and betrayal. Remember, John and Judas sat at the Lord's table, and at the right time and the right order, the shuffle, shakedown, and shakeout will begin. Just as Judas, he moved out at the right time. He was supposed to betray Jesus at the right at a specific time. It all happened in order. I have such hope for this next season, for God to bring alignment, order, and health to this next chapter of Canada's future. 
But first and foremost, it's for his Canadian church to get healthier than she has ever been. And I really sensed that in this season we were to watch the woman and the women in the House of Commons. The woman and the women in the House of Commons. And that even today, as a church, I just feel like the Lord's inviting us into part of his process as the sign in the church. But really understanding the value of what God's going to do with the women in this hour. And this is not to say if you're a man in here that God's not going to use you. We're just highlighting the women right now. But I just pray, God, for every woman in here right now, that you would stir up their spirit. If they're not doing what you know, what they know they should be doing, I pray that you would stir them up this morning. If they're not standing where they should be standing, that you stir them up. If, there's, if there is an idol, anything idle in their life, God, I pray that you would move the gear into drive in this season. And that, God, you would raise up powerful women in the church in Canada in this hour and powerful women in politics, the political sphere in this hour in Jesus' name. Reposition, position, shuffle, shake. Shake what can be shaken to shake out what shouldn't be there. In Jesus' name, God, we just come into agreement with that. This may be a little overwhelming to you. I don't know, like, I don't know what everybody's thought process is in here right now, but, you know, I think about Paul, who is an amazing inspiration. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. But there's a book called Philippians. Everyone say Philippians. And in this context, historically, Paul was actually, this was his second missionary journey. And he's sitting in prison, waiting potentially on an execution. Because some corrupt governmental fi- uh, government officials threw him into this, this prison. There was accusations, twists and lies. And one of the things that I saw actually God doing in the House of Commons is he was going to expose the crocodile. This is what I saw. He was going to expose the crocodiles. And you're like, what are you talking about? Those with the big mouths and the big jaws. And the big lies. There was going to be some lies, accusations. Some of the big mouths are going to be exposed in this season. But I actually saw it as a spirit. It wasn't people. I saw it as a spirit influencing people. And I heard the Lord say this. I'm going to kill the crocs in this next season in the House of Commons. That's what I heard. Now, I'm, that might be offensive to you. I don't know. But I saw it as a spiritual assault. That God, there was going to be like a spiritual assault over some of the influence that was, that, that was being had with the big mouths. So watch for that, but I don't know why I went there, but anyways. So yeah, Paul was in prison. Paul was in prison, and this is the 11th book of the New Testament. This is Paul's second missionary journey. And he's in prison, waiting on his execution. Listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Listen to what he says. Imagine, okay, you're waiting to die potentially. You're you're, you're put in this prison... And this is the encouragement that you are sending to the church, the believers at Philippi. You're sending out an encouragement while you're waiting potential execution. He says, don't worry about anything. (laughs) The guy's like, he's probably like, in Jesus' name, I am not worrying about anything, you know, while he's writing this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Like, have a good attitude when you're sitting at a table with someone you don't like. Have a good attitude when you're in a battle and you're in a fight. That's really hard. Have a good attitude when you're waiting execution. You've been backstabbed ten times. You've been divorced three. And you're waiting just to give up on life. Don't worry and thank God about everything. What a a word, eh? Think about this for a second. Like, get into the writer. Like, when I read the scripture, I try to get into the head and the heart of the writer by knowing the context from which I'm reading. 
Verse 7 says this, then you will experience God's peace. Like, like give it out, get, get it out, get out your needs, thank God for everything, try to keep your worry to a, a minimal. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. It's like a great counseling technique. Be grat- have, some, have some gratitude for what you do have and what you're hoping for. Be thankful. You know, try to minimize your worry. You know, get out all your needs, all your frustrations, get it all out, and then it says, you'll find some peace. Counseling 101, but this is in the scripture. Which exceeds anything we can understand is peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Like, focus your thoughts on positivity. That's what he's saying. Focus your thoughts on good things. Stop watching all the things that are taking you down, like discouraging you. We get it. There's so much stuff happening in society that's discouraging you. And doom and gloom and all this stuff. And we get it, like... Our kids are being raised up in a culture that's a lot more complicated than it was 30, 40 years ago. We get it, but let's not focus entirely all of our attention on that. What's honorable, what's right, what's pure, what's lovely. Keep putting into practice, verse 9, all you learn and receive from me. Don't stop living it out, he's saying. Like, I've taught you stuff. Like, live it out, practice it. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then God of peace, the God of peace will be with you. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. And fast forward, he's actually thanking, thanking some people for bringing him some generous financial gifts. Actually, that's what he's doing. He's getting there. He's thanking them. Like, listen, I, thank you for being generous while I'm here, but I want you to know that I'm not relying on your generosity because God is sufficient. That's what he's saying. And he's instructing us to do the same. Let's go down to verse 13. This is right after he basically says in verse 12, like, I've learned to be content and live with nothing and live with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's on a full stomach or an empty one. And then he says this, and most all of you know this verse, for I can do all everything or all things through Christ who gives me strength. Some of you have that tattooed on your body. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, but I don't think we really fully understand that. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not because of your own strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, Although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. In some translations, it would say to the tearing down of strongholds. Our weapons are not are mighty through God to tear down strongholds. It's not carnal. We're not fighting with actual weapons here. There's a spiritual battle taking place. So the way we are able to, I can do all things through Christ, who gives me strength, is to understand whose battle it is. It's not yours, but you're called to engage in it. He invites you in because you're a co-laborer. But he's already won the battle, and he's fighting for you, but you're with him in it. You're at the table with him. He's made the buffet, the provision, the knee, everything you need to fight the battle that you're in front of. Because when you're at a table, you're in front of the enemy. Staring at him in the face. But your weapon's not your knife and your fork. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Literally means this. And I'm not going to get into this too, too, too deep here, but it's a choosing to engage the resistance. The word I can do literally means to get into the fray of the fight. That's what it literally means, to get into the fray of the battle. There's an invitation for God that God wants to pull you into. Not that you fight battles by yourself, but that you engage with him in the battles you're called to fight. Are you hearing this this morning? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can engage the deepest level 
of battle. I can engage the resistance. That's what it literally means. The things that are opposing me, what's resisting me. I can engage what's resisting me because I have God on my side. But I cannot engage what's resisting me without him. I cannot engage what's resisting me without him. If you want to fight without him, you will lose every time. But I can engage this spiritual battle with him because this is the type of battle he's called me to be in. This is the table that I'm sitting at. This is the enemy that's in front of me. He says, I can do all things through Christ. How? It's not through me. It's not through you. It's not through social media. It's not through a lot of followers. It's not through a lot of clout. It's not through a lot of money, definitely. It's through Christ. I can get into the fray of every fight that God's called me to fight through Christ. It literally means to be fixed in a position with him with the set parameters of Christ around me. That's what it literally means. I can get through anything when I have the parameters of Christ all around me. When I'm doing it his way. I'm doing it his way, I'll win. Doing it my way, I may just lose. I can do all things through Christ who gives me power, who strengthens me. This verb strengthens means to surcharge with energy. I can do all things with, through the parameters of Christ that he has set around me. I can do all things through Christ. Through these parameters, it's an invitation for strength. It's an invitation for a surcharge of energy. And I want to encourage you this morning in this season of your life, to push because you can stop saying you can't I think you, you can't I don't know about you and your household but you can't is like a swear word to me when my kids say I can't it drives me up the wall no you can you just haven't practiced enough you haven't done it enough don't say you can't you can't is like the worst thing you can say to God I can't God is up there being like, yeah, you, you know, oh, shoot, you're actually right. You can't. That was a mistake. Shouldn't have put you in that season. He quotes scriptures like, well, God never, will never give you more than you can handle. That's an out-of-context scripture. That's about temptation, not about life. God will absolutely give you more than you can handle every day of the week so you rely on him who can do all things, who gives him strength. That's your word. Like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, all things are everything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. How can I do that? Through him who gives me strength. I know I keep repeating myself, but it's like we got to stop saying I can't. God will give you more than you can handle. He'll allow life to break you in half. So he can be the one to build you back up again. Every one of you in this room is like a Humpty Dumpty restored. You've fallen off your wall but it's God's desire to build you back up again. That's his nature. So God, do it in us in this season. Because we can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I pray that when we push in this season, and we stop saying we can't, that we will begin to see your strength and your power move through. I want you to stand up with me just as we close here. If we can, just, just, just open up your hands just in any way possible, just to receive right now. I just, I believe in this right now. I believe there's an impartation in the room for new strength. And God wants to give you a new level of confidence in his ability to energize you for life in this next season. You can you can, you can. God, we repent where we've said we can't. We repent where we've used that word, I can't. It won't work. I'm not enough. God, we, we repent for that. Today, we just declare over ourselves that we can. I can do all things through Christ. He gives me strength. I can do it. I can do it. I can push through this. I can push through this challenge in a relationship. I can push through this rela a relational, this marriage challenge. I can push through this career 
issue, this resistance I'm feeling in my career path. I can, I can push through this not knowing what's next. I can push through this hard season of tension with my kids. I can push through this debt and this financial burden that I'm carrying. I can push through not knowing what, what, what to do next, not, not knowing how to navigate this season of my life. I can push through what feels confusing in this season. I can push through what feels hopeless. I can push through what feels discouraging. I can push through whatever it is that's in front of me, whatever, whatever it is that's sitting across at the table in front of me, I can push through, and I see I see the power of God, the buffet at the table, right in front of me. Everything I need, everything I need is right there for the fight, is 